All right. Uh, good afternoon. I do not have anything from the top, so Matt, you want to kick us off? Oh, no, no, that, that, that's a surprise. You want to say anything about your uh, former boss? The Justice Department? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't think I do. Senator Go from New Jersey. Uh, no, I certainly don't have any comment on the law enforcement matter. <laughs> um, okay, let's uh, let's go to um, what what have you guys heard, if anything, from uh, foreign governments about uh, what's happened over the la course of the last seventy two hours um, uh, with the Republican convention, the nomination of. Uh, of J.D. Vance as vice president, his positions on on Ukraine and other matters. So I'm not aware of any specific conversations about um, either the vice presidential nominee of the Republican Party. Obviously, when you had NATO in town last week, you did have a bunch of conversations on the side sidelines of events between people all around town about the election in the United States, just as we have conversations, you know, social conversations about elections in, in other countries. I think people are well aware of the election that's happening here, but um, I'm not aware of any specific conversations over the last 24, 72 hours about the Republican convention. Uh, okay. I'll leave it there. Definitely. I'm sure people want to go okay. to the Middle East. I have to you said yesterday that you had seen civilian casualties come down from high points of the conflict and from where they were six weeks ago, but that you wanted to see them end completely. Palestinian health officials said at least 57, were, 57 people were killed in Israeli bombardments. Uh, does this increase your concerns at all? And have you raised this with your Israeli counterparts? It doesn't increase our concerns because our we have had uh, extraordinary concerns about civilian casualties for some time. Um, and that's why we are pushing so hard, not just pushing, but actively negotiating to get a ceasefire that would stop this daily tragedy where you see innocent Palestinian civilians being killed as a result of this war. Um, but even before the, uh, we get to a, uh, what we hope will be a ceasefire, continue to push Israel to take uh, further measures to minimize civilian harm. The Secretary pushed Ron Dermer and National Security Advisor Hanegbi when they were here yesterday. We understand, look, in all, in all of these strikes, Israel has said publicly that they were striking militants. And of course, we've seen reported deaths of militants, including Hamas leaders in some of these strikes, but we've also seen credible reports of civilian deaths. And so um, uh, it is why we continue to push so hard for a ceasefire, which is the, the way to really get a lasting solution to the ongoing violence in Gaza. Hamas has accused Israel of stepping up attacks to try and derail efforts for a ceasefire deal. Do you have are any concern that that is the case? No, I don't think I, I don't I don't think the strikes that they are taking have anything to do with a ceasefire deal. I think, as they said publicly, they are trying to, as they have done from the from the days right after October seventh, trying to um, degrade and ultimately end Hamas's ability to launch attacks on the state of Israel. Separately, we have heard from Israel repeatedly, public, publicly. We've heard from them privately that they are committed to trying to reach a ceasefire. They're committed to the proposal that they put forward and that the president outlined publicly over a month ago, about a month and a half ago now. And they continue to remain engaged in the talks to try to reach a ceasefire. Can I follow up? I'll come, I'll come back to you. Yeah, Said, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, on, on this point, that was just uh, raised. I mean, you know, uh, Israel says that they were targeting Hamas, but you don't have any independent sources that confirmed there was actually Hamas leaders in, in that building that was is targeted. Do you? Uh, I do not. With, the, with respect to this particular strike, no, I do not. Now, yeah. we have seen credible evidence all throughout this war that Hamas has okay. hidden its fighters, hidden its leadership inside civilian infrastructure inside civilian right. inside schools i can't speak with respect to this specific strike but certainly those are actions that are consistent right. with the pattern of behavior we have seen from hamas where was that you know can you share with us some of that behavior the pattern of behavior in particular places and so on yeah in fact saeed i remember you and i having this exchange we, we several do. months ago and i emailed you an article right. that detailed hamas's right. long history of hiding I in uh, and i think it was actually more than one article several articles detailing okay. hamas my point being you don't need intelligence assessments from the U.S. government or anyone else. Hamas's okay. 
long established behavior mm -hmm. of hiding in civilian sites predates October 7th and certainly we've right. seen it in, over the course of this conflict. Right. But that, that makes, let's say, targeting one person worth killing 100 people? We don't want to see, no, okay. we, so we do not want to see civilians die. Now, the, 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 uh, I would say a lot of this would be solved if Hamas mm -hmm. behaved like a military organization. Mm -hmm. We talk about other conflicts where this is not an issue because you don't see the military leadership hiding in hospitals, hiding in schools, hiding in religious sites, hiding in apartment buildings. If Hamas stopped doing it, it would certainly make uh, the job of the IDF easier to mm -hmm. target Hamas leadership without civilian casualties. But that said, as long as they continue to behave that way, the IDF still has the responsibility to do everything it can to minimize civilian casualties. Well, you know, the whole of Gaza is the size of Washington Metropolitan, Washington, D.C. Uh, I mean, it, it is a guerrilla force. It's not an army. They're not allowed to have airplanes and tanks and so on, but that, 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 that's not the, so the, the size of Gaza right. does not justify mm -hmm. okay. hiding your fighters mm -hmm. inside a hospital that's, or right, inside a school. Let me ask you about something that you just said, this is a, 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 that Israel wants to degrade and deplete and, and uh, you know, render Hamas totally incapable of launching an attack like uh, the one we saw on October 7th. Well, the president himself said that Hamas was unable to do that anymore back on the 31 of May, didn't he? He did, yeah. Okay, so why why do we continue to do the same thing over and over again? If Hamas no longer is capable of doing this, if the United States of America, the preeminent power on earth, you know, and, and the one that keeps uh, the Israeli military sustained and so on, says, look, they are no longer, this reason is no longer valid because they no longer are able to do that, so, uh, as the president said. A few things about that. Um, it has, yes, it is our assessment that they no longer have the capability to launch an attack uh, with a size, on the size and scale and scope right. of the attacks of October 7th. Hamas, without a doubt, does still pose a threat to Israel and does still pose a threat to Israeli civilians. Hamas continues to be a legitimate military mm -hmm. target for the government of Israel to strike. That said, it has also long been our view, and you've heard me talk about this, you've heard the Secretary talk about this, that Israel will never defeat Hamas through military action alone, and that it is going to require um, ultimately a political solution to a struggle between Israel and Palestinians that predates Hamas, um, that dates back decades. And if you were to ultimately reach an end to the violence between Israel and the Palestinian people that has gone on for decades, it will take more than a military campaign against Hamas, a terrorist organization. It will take a political solution. Of course, you see us continue to try to advance that. So taking these two positions exactly that you, you, know, you just articulately illustrated, yeah, that, isn't that like a catch-22 situation? The war will go on forever because there will always be uh, Palestinians who will fight the Israeli occupation, no matter what, so, under, under whatever conditions. So are you saying this war can go on forever? We need to have completely neutralized Hamas, completely I, I, neutralized I, I, I think you. I, I think that question ignores everything I have said and everything that we have been pushing to try to do for some time. Now, let me just finish. It ignores the fact that we are pushing to obtain a ceasefire to stop the immediate death in Gaza. It ignores what the president has said and what the secretary has said repeatedly, and it's reflective of what we are trying to do, that we want to take that ceasefire and turn it into enduring calm, and we want to turn the enduring calm into lasting peace and stability. Now, um, my I'll, last question, I'll there was, you know, uh, UNRWA was, an UNRWA headquarters was flattened uh, in Gaza. Do you have any comment on that? I mean, uh, UNRWA has been the primary provider of aid and help, education, health care, and all these things for the Palestinians. Without UNRWA, well, there will be, you know, humanitarian disaster on your hand. Do you have any comment on what has happened to UNRWA thus far? So we do support the work that UNRWA does. We've made that quite clear. Um, they are a critical delivery mechanism for humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people in Gaza. They have played an important role in delivering humanitarian assistance uh, on the front lines since the outset of this conflict. And uh, it has been really critical that they is that that work has been critical, and it's cr critical that they. Uh, continue it. But with respect to this strike, it goes back to the problem I was speaking to a moment ago, which you do continue to have Hamas leadership, Hamas militants that hide themselves in civilian sites. Uh, and Israel um, has the, the has a, a rightful goal of attacking militants, 
and preventing them from continuing to threaten the state of Israel and the, the people of Israel, but they need to do so in a way that minimizes civilian harm. Go ahead. Uh, just want to follow up on the, your answer to Said about the day after and the plan for uh, for peace in the Middle East. You've been, I mean, from this podium or even from many other platforms in the U.S. government, you've been pushing for months now for a day after plan from the Israelis, and you're pushing your you're pushing with the regional players to find a formula for a, turn, uh, for a peace that will last, uh, everlasting peace. But what we hear from the Israelis is in a different page. They are op opposing any Palestinian control of Gaza. They're not willing to enter any discussion internally about the day after. And in, in, in principle, they are, uh, the Netanyahu government and his factions are against the two-state solution. You've been pushing for months. Do you have any way of pushing more or putting, exerting more pressure on the Israelis to engage in that? So a few things about this. Just one, um, one kind of factual note. So with respect to plans for the day after, uh, I spoke about this a little bit uh, lately. We have seen the Israeli government start to develop more of their own plans and put more of their own plans forward. Not as advanced as we would like to see, certainly. Um, but, but just as a, a factual matter, they have been ha starting to have those conversations internally. And they've been having those conversations with us, and I believe they've been having those conversations with others in the region as well. Um, which is not to say that there is a fully formed plan that is, that is ready to go, or more, certainly one that would be acceptable to the, the broader community, but they are at least uh, advancing in their thinking on uh, of that issue. Um, but I would say that with respect to the, the longer term issue, uh, we ultimately, Israel is going to have to make some tough choices, which is always the case. It's been the case with this uh, struggle between Israel and Palestinians for decades that ultimately resolving it requires tough choices by both sides of this conflict. And to get to in our view, a lasting end of this conflict, it's going to have to take tough decisions by Israel. The case that we will make to them, to get to your question, is that ultimately making some of these tough decisions is actually, are, is actually in their interest. It's in their long-term security interest. Um, it is, of course, in the interest of the Palestinian people to see lasting stability in Gaza, to see reconstruction, to see um, uh, a better form of governance than what they've had since uh, uh, Hamas uh, took control of the Strip several a couple of decades ago. But it's also in Israel's long-term security interest to find a lasting resolution to this conflict. So we will continue to press that case to them, um, but they, they will have to make decisions for themselves, as every sovereign country has to do. But it's just, it is just our view, and, is it that, and we certainly hope that p the people of Israel will uh, ultimately endorse this view as well, that continuing to have this long-term security threat staring them in the face is a problem for their security, and it is a barrier to their long-term integration with the region, which is something Israel has wanted from the very founding of the state. Uh, well, what, what's the Palestinians' options here? I mean, until is the Israelis or the Israeli government reach a sober moment to accept that it has to do tough choices, as you said, what are the Palestinians' options to, to fight this occupation? So, that would be acceptable to you. So, uh, when you say Palestinians, I don't know if you mean the Palestinian people, if you mean the Palestinian Authority. There's Let's a lot, say there the, lo there the, lots, the there, there are lots of different, lots of different ways. What, what was the, what was the answer? Let's just say the Palestinian. Nothing. The Palestinian. Authority. So there are lots of different answers. To, that's why I asked. There's lots of different ways to answer that question. Um, we think there are things that the Palestinian Authority can do. We think there are reforms that the Palestinian Authority can make that will make it clear that they are um, uh, a reformed, revitalized authority that can serve as a credible governing structure, both for the people of the West Bank and the people of Gaza. And that's a message that they could send both to the government of Israel, but also to the Palestinian people who we know want to see a reformed PA. So that's, that is one thing. Ultimately, what we are trying to do is work with the Palestinian Authority and work with partners in the region who we know want to see lasting peace and stability and want to see the establishment of an independent, independent Palestinian state. And so um, uh, that's what we'll continue to do. Um, Go ahead. Uh, regarding specifically the attack on Saturday, Israel's attack on Gaza's units. So Israel said it was targeting Hamas commander Mohammed Dave 
and they are yet to confirm whether he was killed or not. Do you expect them to confirm it soon? If they won't, does this concern you? Because we know more than 90 civilians killed, including children, but we don't know whether the Hamas commander was killed or not, or even, even he was there after all. So with respect to Mohammed Daif, I will defer to the government of Israel to speak, uh, uh, to, to determine when they might be able to make some kind of assessment and when they will speak to it. That's ultimately a call for them to make. We do know that um, uh, they were successful in, in killing other militants, including a, a, a Hamas commander in that strike. But that said, to answer the question, no, the deaths of any civilians are not acceptable. We don't want to, we don't accept the deaths of civilians in any strike. And that is why we continue to push for a ceasefire to stop this daily death inside Gaza. Do you think these kind of situations hamper ongoing ceasefire negotiations? Because we know civilians killed at the moment, but they are yet to confirm the Hamas commander they said they were targeting was killed or not. Do you think these kind of uh, vague situations hamper the ongoing ceasefire process? Because we know the U.S. want to seal the deal as soon as possible. So I'm not going to speculate. I'm going to speak to what we've seen. And what we've seen is that the ceasefire negotiations have continued. And despite various public statements that are made by both sides on this conflict from, t from time to time, what we have actually seen in the negotiations is pushing forward to try to get a deal. So I'm not going to speculate about what could, what could happen. Obviously, people can always pull out of negotiations for their own reasons. We hope that won't happen. We haven't seen it happen yet. What we have seen uh, has made us believe we can get to a deal, which, of course, does not mean that we will. We're going to continue to try to push for one. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, you said that uh, Hamas is a military organization, of course, several times. Terrorist organization, time. I think. It's bo it, Hamas is, uh, both, both has, is a terrorist organization that does have uh, uh, certain aspects of it that make it look like a military. Yes, it's ultimately sir. a terrorist organization. Yes, sir. One, who is supporting them, who is financing them, and they have had miles and miles of uh, underground tunnels going from there to different places and terrorists are living there, were living, and they were sharing all these tunnels. So where do we stand? Where do we go from here? And who is supporting them? And they have headquarters in Qatar. Uh, they have been uh, largely financially backed by the state of Iran, which is why we have taken uh, actions to hold Iran accountable for its financing of not just Hamas, but other terrorist organizations in the region. Can I go back, and, uh, I go back to something you, you said in sure. response to <clears throat> an earlier question. Uh, you said several times Israel is going to have to make tough decisions. Uh, I think you said three times. Is it, does Hamas not, to, or do the Palestinians not have to make tough decisions too? Why, why are they, you saying No, they, all, they all do. Because the, qu the question was about Israel. Uh, the question well, was about okay, the, the yeah, question but, was about but, the. But your answer, your. So but I, I, the question was about the state of Israel, and that's yeah. why I talked about Israel. I did in a question about what the Palestinian, but Palestinians could do. I talked about tough things that the Palestinian Authority needed to do, including making internal reforms. I mean, how, your your understanding of how this whole conflict started is still that it was Hamas attacking Israel correct? on October seventh. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so why? say now that it's only the Israelis who have to make tough decisions. I certainly don't believe it is only the Israelis that well, have to make tough decisions. The question was about Israel, but as I said, it has long been the case in resolving conflicts. It takes uh, parties on both sides making tough decisions. Okay. So Hamas has to make a tough decision too? Is that well, I mean, it, I mean, it depends how you look at it. I, we think it ought not to be a tough decision to reach a ceasefire because it would um, alleviate the suffering of the people that they claim to represent, but it certainly has been tough. Well, to, it has been tough for them to come to that decision but, well, here to date. Well, okay, fine. But, but, then, but then, then it ought not to be a tough decision for Israel either, right? Because um, they would get, according to you, ought not, according, to ought, your, according to your theory here, if they take a tough decision and, and, and you know, agree to a ceasefire, they're going to be safe. So ought not be, but would that the world were so simple, Matt. <laughs> would that the world be so simple. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, same in connection with what I had. Uh, recently, in this connection question, recently Prime Minister Modi of India was in Moscow meeting with the President Putin. They discussed about this the situation in the Middle East in a big range many times, including this time uh, when NATO meetings were going on here. 
So where do we go as far as Prime Minister Modi's uh, discussion with President Putin that this war is must be ending and people, countries must come to an end to have a peace uh, for the um, for peace forever in the Middle East between these uh, nations, Israel and other countries, war is going on in the region. So I don't have any specific comment on that other than that, um, as we have said before, we have never seen Russia willing to play any kind of a productive role in resolving conflicts uh, in the Middle East, certainly this conflict in the Middle East. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, Shannon, go ahead. Sorry. Is it okay to change the topic? Um, sure. Change region? Um, in Thailand, uh, in a luxury hotel in Bangkok, six people were found dead, including two American nationals. Police are investigating it as a possible poisoning case. Are you in contact with your Thai counterparts in assisting in any way? So we are aware of the reports of the deaths of two U.S. citizens in uh, Bangkok, Thailand. We offer our sincere condolences to the families on their loss. We are closely monitoring the situation and stand ready to provide consular assistance to those families. Whenever a U.S. citizen dies in a foreign country, uh, local authorities are responsible for determining the cause of death. Um, we do reach out to local authorities often to, um, uh, to communicate them about to communicate with them when it involves the death of a U.S. citizen, and we will certainly be doing so here, but I would defer to the local authorities for any further comment on what I believe is an ongoing investigation. And Secretary Blinken spoke with the Thai Foreign Minister earlier today, I believe. Did the deaths come up on the phone call at all? So the call happened around 9 o'clock this morning. I think it might have been before we saw the reports of the deaths, so I don't know that it came up in the call, but I'll have to check and get back with you to, to confirm. Yeah, keep um, I was wondering if you have any updates on the RFERL uh, journalist detained in Russia, also Kurmasheva. Um, has any new information come to light to be able to designate her as wrongfully detained? Uh, no, I don't have any new information to report. Obviously, as we've said, journalism is not a crime, and we have urged her swift release, um, but I don't have any new information to provide about a, a wrongful, deter wrongful detention determination. Yeah, but to follow up on that question, given that uh, this week is going to mark nine months of her arrest, you know, when there is a lack of transparency about the process here, it does trigger a lot of questions about, you know, what is the reason to why she's not being designated? Is it because she's she's Muslim, she's a citizen, so, she's a female, or, or what's the reason? Okay, Alex, give me a break. That's a, that is a, that is a, a, a ridiculous thing to, to to raise that it's because of of, of her that. gender. We have wrongfully we have designated both men and women wrongfully uh, as wrongfully detained. And if you look at our track record in this administration, we have returned over 40 wrongfully detained American citizens. So I think the track record actually shows this administration taking this work incredibly seriously and working hard and to making tough choices sometimes to return those who, U.S. citizens who have been detained overseas. It is the top priority for the president. It is the top priority for the, the secretary to make sure that U.S. citizens overseas are safe and secure. And we take the process extremely seriously. I know it doesn't always move as quickly as uh, you or some others would want. Um, but I think if you look at our record, it shows the, the, that we are able to get results. And for those Americans who may remain wrongfully detained and other Americans who, who are detained overseas, we are working day and night to get them home. And with respect to her case, as I've said, we've, um, uh, we have called for her release. Her husband and her daughters are in town. Uh, is the secretary or anyone in this building planning to meet with them? Uh, I don't have any meetings to announce today. Uh, I want to stay in the region. Uh, Russia's Lavrov uh, just landed in New York this morning, along with Zakharova and others. Both are actually under you know, current U.S. Uh, visa restrictions. We have discussed that previously in previous years that you guys, uh, you know, comply with you know obligations, you know, 1947 agreement. Uh, but the question is, how does it look like right now? I mean, we discussed just three weeks ago how Russia not only you know violates you know the UN charter, but also does violate UN sanctions on North Korea. You know, we discussed how they you know gifted a car to North Korean uh, dictator. So, uh, how, first of all, uh, what restrictions they are under when they're going to be in New York? And secondly, what does it, uh, how does it look like when you think about UN credibility and and this man is going to lead you know Security Council meeting? So. Um, uh when you want to speak to our credibility when it comes to Russia, look at our Imagine actions. The UN. No, no, hold, no, hold. Look at our actions over the past two two years with holding Russia accountable, and I think it uh, it answers that question quite well. When it comes to the United Nations and and representatives of any country attending events at the United Nations, we have a responsibility as the host of the United Nations uh, to allow foreign diplomats to attend. That is an obligation that has been upheld 
for decades by administrations of both parties, and it's one that the United States takes seriously. That said, we do have the ability to impose restrictions to make sure that diplomats um, that do attend for legitimate UN meetings only can participate in those meetings and can't um, take off on, say, tourist uh, t tourism visits across the United States. Is the States. Secretary applied to boycott his ministerial? Um, Lavrov's ministerial? I don't have any any um, any announcements to make. Would, would it discourage other go allies ahead. like mine? Go ahead, Nick. Okay. I have a follow up on Menendez, um, just seeing reporting that he had continued to receive foreign policy and intelligence briefings despite being accused of being a foreign agent for Egypt and Qatar now convicted. From a State Department perspective, does that is that cause for any concern? I, I just don't have any comment on, uh, on that at all. It's, it's a, it remains a law enforcement matter, and ultimately um, the question of who receives those type of briefings is a matter for the Senate to decide. Yeah, Jack. Um, sorry, just a quick question on Vance, who Trump thinks as his running mate yesterday. He's been a vocal critic of U.S. aid for Ukraine and has said that Britain was an Islamist nuclear arms country. Uh, what's the administration's view of this, and do you have any concerns that this could endanger the relationship? Um, so I'm going to probably have a tough time over the next few months when there are going to be a lot of claims made on the campaign trail that I want to respond to and probably shouldn't respond to. Um, so I will instead just speak about uh, our record and our record of support for Ukraine. And ultimately, I think the question really comes down to not just what we support and what anyone else in public life supports, but what the American people support. And what we have seen is when it comes to Ukraine, the American people strongly support continued assistance to Ukraine. They strongly support allowing Ukraine and helping Ukraine to defend itself against Russia's aggression. And it's not just the American public, but it's bipartisan majorities in both houses of Congress. And when you saw the supplemental uh, appropriations bill finally get a vote after obstruction on one side of the aisle, we saw an overwhelming vote in support of military assistance. So I think that's probably where I should leave it with that. And with respect to the United Kingdom, look, we have a longstanding close relationship, a special relationship with the, the United Kingdom. And despite any kind of um, uh, no, I, I, I won't comment it at all. I think the American people understand the, the importance of that relationship and would reject any attempts to mischaracterize it. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia today uh, or yesterday signed an agreement uh, on space. What's the importance of this agreement? And is it part of the larger uh, package that the U.S. is uh, working with the Saudi Arabia on? So that, does, that, is a, that is a separate um, a separate agreement from the ongoing discussions we have had with Saudi Arabia about what further regional integration would look like and what improved bilateral relationships and improved bi uh, expanded bilateral agreements between the United States and Saudi Arabia would look like in the context of regional integration. So it is a separate, it is a uh, separate agreement. That said, the specifics to it, I'll have to take the question and get, get back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The uh, question is regarding the President Biden's recent interview to 360 with Speedy in which he said that he got call from Saudis and they want to fully recognize Israel with the security conditions. The question is, we have seen uh, a brief security brief by the national security team to the Congress about the uh, the nuclear cooperation, that is civilian nuclear program with the Saudi Arabia. And uh, we got misdirections from the Congress, from the Republicans and Democrats. Some wrote a letter to President Biden to uh, condition it with the uh, non-proliferation and some said, like, you, we, you have to look twice on this. So it seemed like uh, there is some prioritizing by the U.S. And uh, in this interview, President Biden didn't mention anything that so these are mentioning two-state solution for the Palestinian, Palestine. So is there anything cons under consideration regarding the just with the security guarantees for the normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel? So do you mean, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Do you mean that we would just do a an agreement with Saudi Arabia absent? With um, the security deal context. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, look, it, it, you've heard me speak to this before, and you've heard other leaders of our government. That, no, this is a package deal that it all works together, um, or it doesn't really work at all. And we've heard the, the government of Saudi Arabia say that something that's important for them for normalization um, is to get uh, a legitimate um, path to two states. And so... We continue to look at this as something that we believe is very important, something that we believe is hopefully achievable, but no, it's, we're not uh, pursuing a separate agreements.
वन ऑन पाकिस्तान टू मोर सिक्योरिटी पर्सनल गार्ड केल्ड इन हार्स लॉन्ग एक्सचेंज ऑफ फायर विद दरिस्ट एंड अगेन दीज आर टेरिस्ट कमिंग फ्राम द सेफ हैवन इन अफगानिस्तान सो यू स्पोकन मैनी टाइम फ्राम दिस पोडियम एंड द क्वेश्चन इज डू यूनाइट स्टेट्स हैव सम कंसर्न विद द a person who took responsibility or who took guarantees in doha agreement that they will not let them use this soil against the neighboring pakistan who been a us ally so you have any concerns you have anything on this you have any anything on this sure so i'll first say that that of course the pakistani people have suffered greatly at the hands of violent extremists and terrorists we have a shared interest with uh, the pakistani people and the government of pakistan in combating threats to regional security and yes we do continue to urge the taliban to ensure that uh, terrorist attacks are not la- launched from the from afghan soil that has been uh, a priority for us in in engagements with them and it continues to be Yeah, sure. uh, on the diplomatic solution between Israel and Hezbollah, is there a, uh, an agreement already ready to be signed in case there is a ceasefire in Gaza? So I'm not going to speak in detail to the diplomacy that we have been pursuing to resolve the conflict in, uh, across the blue line, other than to say that we continue, it continues to be our assessment that it's important to get a ceasefire in Gaza to unlock the the possibility of an agreement uh, to that conflict. So it's something that we're pursuing, but um, you've heard Hezbollah say that, say publicly that if there is a ceasefire in Gaza, they will stop their attacks in uh, on Israel. We don't think they need to wait for that, but um, uh, certainly that's what they've said. So we'll continue to pr- pursue diplomacy to resolve that conflict, but we really do think a ceasefire in Gaza is important to, to unlocking a further possibility of achieving it. Thank you. Um, who's that? Go- yeah, go ahead. Thank oh, you very Joel, much. I'll come to you next. Yeah. Thank you very much. I knew there was somebody over there. That's like, there was somebody over here that had their hand up. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, that elections are getting close, so you are going to be asked questions about campaigns. Um, so Sarah Sanders, when she was the spokesperson at the White House, uh, her child and my child were in class, but for five years I did, or four years, I did not go to the White House press briefings. Um, but uh, when... This administration came and I did go. I was not uh, treated uh, anything uh, much nicer either. Is this about expect- the stool again at the White House? You uh, raised this in a previous briefing. Stool, and I didn't, and I wasn't, I didn't know. <laughs> it's the handicap seat and I don't think it's funny it. at all. No, I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't no, no, know, I didn't, just, I didn't know that's what I'm it was. Just, I remember I'm you raising it previously. The elections the are context. coming, so I had much better, uh, I had very good hopes on President Biden administration regarding the media treatment. What I'm saying is that during their time, I did not even go once for the press briefing because they're right. at Let me just interrupt you quickly to ask that you get to the question. Sorry, I, as much as I enjoy the, the, the extended okay. wind-ups. So Voice of America had asked you a question that Taliban are asking about the helicopters uh, from Uzbekistan and you had said that you would reply them back. Uh, is there any update about those helicopters or no? Uh, we did get back to Voice of America. If you're interested in the answer, I'll take it back and get, get, get the uh, same okay, answer just, back to you. Just one last question. Last week, a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to listen to one of the three of you. amazing diplomats, Ambassador Munter, Ambassador Hale, and Ambassador Peterson. And Peterson, they all served in Pakistan as ambassadors. One of them said that it's great that Pakistan is off the back, so we don't have to pay billions of dollars every year. Uh, Ambassador Ann Peterson said that the fifth largest country in the world should not be let down and uh, uh, should not be the way it is basically right now. Uh, just give me a little bit of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Where is Pakistan fitting in this whole situation right now? Because from what I see, Pakistan seems to be going down in almost every aspect that I can think of. So Pakistan it continues to be a close partner that we work with on a number of important matters, including improving the Pakistan economy. You've heard me speak uh, a number of times to the importance of securing an IMF facility and Pakistan making reforms uh, in that regard, and we'll continue to do so. All right, Thank Joel. you. Thanks, Matt. Um, just want to, I guess, follow up really briefly on the, on the Saudi Arabia question. Yeah. Um, You know, I, I should be clear that the, the president's uh, characterization of it was broadly correct. Um, and then do you think that you have time to, you, you know, in this administration in the, to uh, work out that kind of deal if, if events unfold in Israel the way you want? Or, or has that window closed? So I don't want to put a, a timeline on it. Um, partly because, look, you've heard the secretary say that in his conversations with the 
crown prince of Saudi Arabia, there's, there are two things that he needs to be able to reach a deal. One is calm in Gaza. Two is a path to, to uh, an independent Palestinian state. We don't yet have a calm in Gaza, so it's a little hard to speculate about the timeline of a normalization deal when we haven't reached the first milestone. So we're going to continue to push to get calm in Gaza, to get a ceasefire. We have plans we are working with our partners in the region about on security and governance and ultimately reconstruction for Gaza in and the period after a conflict. And as part of that, we are discussing with Saudi Arabia what a, a broad normalization integration deal would look like. But there is a lot of work that remains to be done to get there, including, of course, the, the question about a ceasefire in Gaza. OK. And then if I could just follow up also on the on the Russia question. Um, you know, Sergey Lavrov's in New York today, and he mentioned obviously he's been talk about possible more, you know, peace talks with Ukraine and Russia at some point. Um, he, he he mentioned that a political diplomatic solution must be accompanied by concrete steps to eliminate threats to the Russian Federation from the Western Euro-Atlantic direction. It seems to be a, a reference to that draft treaty they put on the, put out in 2021. Um, I know you're very deferential to Ukrainians in, talk, in terms of talking about Ukrainian, yeah. uh, the Ukrainian position there. Are you, are, are you guys willing at all to have some kind of larger conversation connected to, to, to that process? And what do you make also, um, you know, he, he mentioned that it would have to be, you know, take into account geostrategic realities on the Eurasian continent. Um, like, is it your, there's been a lot of, a lot of talk in, the, in this room and elsewhere about China enabling Russia's defense industry uh, <clears throat> for the war in Ukraine. Is it your understanding that China is also backing Russia in terms of its negotiating position or, or desired negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis NATO and that larger project? Uh, so when it comes when it comes to the the um, this wasn't part of the question, but maybe the premise of the question. You're right that we do think that Ukraine needs to be at the forefront of any diplomacy to end the war because they are the victim of this aggression. It is their territory that's being occupied. It's their people that have been killed that continue to suffer as a result of a war that they did not start, that they've suffered from. And in fact, they've been suffering from for 10 years now. Of course, it's not just a war that started in February of 2022. So it is important that Ukraine be in the driver's seat for what is ultimately their future, and we will support them in whatever way possible. To the larger question you asked about it, though, the, the problem with that formulation, not the formulation of your question, but the problem with the formulation from the foreign minister is there's no one in Europe that is threatening Russia. There's no one in Europe that was threatening Russia before the invasion of uh, Ukraine, either the invasion of Ukraine in 2014 or the, inv the full-scale invasion in 2022. What Russia seems to see as a threat is a democracy functioning on its borders. And that's just not a legitimate view. There's not been a military threat. No one is threatened to take Russian territory, to take Russian land. Um, so we reject that view. And um, so we'll continue to work with our Ukrainian partners on where diplomacy can take ultimately ending this conflict with a just peace, not just a peace, but a just and a lasting peace. With respect to China, so um, uh, look, we have seen, as you said, um, further relationship between uh, China and Russia, and it's not just with respect to revitalizing the defense industrial base, it is also with respect to being a major strategic partner of Russia. And you've seen close ties between President Putin and President Xi, um, with visits between the two. And so I, don't ultimately, I can't ultimately predict where it will go. What I can tell you is that when we have talked directly to the Chinese government, we have said that ultimately we would hope that they could play a productive role in ending the conflict, but it needed to be a role that recognized who was the aggressor and who was the victim. And it was not just getting peace for peace sake, but also getting peace that was a just peace and a lasting peace for the state of Ukraine. But ultimately, I can't tell you what they're going to do. Can I follow up on sure. Saudi Arabia? Sure. You know, uh, yesterday, the president in an interview said that uh, the Saudi conditions for normalization with Israel would be you know, a guarantee of protection by the United States and for the provision of, of arms and, and a security agreement, uh, and also uh, the ability to have a peaceful uh, nuclear uh, program and so on. He did not mention uh, a Saudi condition that has always been, you know, laid in the back 
about a Palestinian state and, and all these things. So that answer is just with respect to the bilateral agreements between the United States. I know some it, it does get some confusing sometimes because in these discussions, there are bilateral agreements that would take place between right. the United States and Saudi Arabia um, as part of an integration deal, a normalization deal, and then there are other uh, things that have to happen between Saudi Arabia and, of course, of Israel, the two countries that would be normalizing relationship with each other. So but, it, but Saudi Arabia has always made clear that for that still, to move still forward, does, as as it still know. does, as all, as, it has always made clear and still makes clear that they need to see calm in Gaza and they need to see a path to two states. That has not changed. Alex, go ahead and then we'll wrap for today. Last week's uh, Washington communique uh, was completely silent about Georgia, like zero mentioning of Georgia in comparison with previous years. You know, in Vilnius they had an entire chapter on his membership beat, you know, uh, your authentic aspirations. Uh, can you have us put that in the context? I know that you guys hosted the foreign minister in this building. Uh, any, uh, what, what is your view of uh, Georgia? You know, lacking uh, you know, uh, in, in this in this speed. So we continue to support the Georgian people's Euro-Atlantic uh, aspirations, but we have seen the government of Georgia take a different turn and take a different path. We've seen the uh, government of Georgia take uh, uh, pass laws that move Georgia away from its democratic trajectory. Uh, as you know, you've spoken about the law that they passed and how the effect that it could have on civil society and the way it could enable government crackdowns on legitimate democratic rights, and so. It is the Georgian government's actions that have fundamentally altered its relationship with the United States, but not just with the United States, with other with countries in Europe. And on, on that point, uh, any update for us regarding the second uh, tranche? Uh, uh, no. Of no, no updates from here. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.